good from the first cast. This issue of Kayak Fish Video Magazine kicks off with instant grouper gratification on Baja's Cedros Island. Then, Jeff Little scores a four pound bronze back while showing us how to slow roll swim baits for smallmouth. Chris Funk gives a heavyweight analysis of those kayak weight limits, and Robert Field shows us how he rolls on an epic West Coast tour. Finally, sit back and drool as Chef Funk shares a southern secret, the best shrimp and grits you ever tasted. Kayak Fish Video Magazine starts now. Hey guys, Morgan Pomnitz here with Kayak Fish Magazine. If you're running a GoPro camera while you're out there kayak fishing, you have to check out the Refuel 24 hour battery. It's amazing. You plug it onto the back of your GoPro, hit record, and it's gonna be running your camera all day long, so you don't miss any of the action. On a recent trip down to Cedros Island with CedrosKayakFishing.com, we got down to the beach, launched the kayaks, and there was a little rock wall that uh, guards the, the harbor over there. And a couple of the guys had mentioned that there's a possibility of hooking a gr broomtail grouper. And I scratched my head and thought, man, I didn't know you could catch broomtails down here. But anyways, we went out there. I had my five inch MC swim bait, my one ounce war baits lead head, and I cast that sucker right out there, let it um, sink down to the bottom and gave it a couple of cranks. And all of a sudden, wham, I got hit by something big. And I set the hook and I thought this is either a world record calico bass or maybe I've hooked into one of these broomtail grouper and Kevin said uh, on our way flying down there that he was really hoping to catch one and so I'm fighting it, fighting it and it comes up, it back breaks the surface and I identify it as a broomtail grouper, I couldn't believe it. And so the guys were all excited, there was a bunch of screaming and shouting and got him up to the boat, got the uh, boga grip on his lip and lifted him up, took a few pictures and then uh, turned around and went to set him free. And as he, uh, as he swam back down, he whooped his tail and just sprayed me with a bunch of water. It was a cool way of him saying like, hey man, um, I'm out of here. That was fun for you, but I don't want to be caught again. crayfish shells so they're omnivores they eat a little bit of everything we'll go ahead and put this one back and then talk about swim bait fishing all right so think of fishing this the same way that you think of slow rolling a spinner bait it's a very you know very slow and purposeful presentation you cast it out there I like to pick targets and I didn't really just pick one there but when I caught that last fish I had the target of the front side of the, the bridge pile so I'm letting it sink just like you do with a slow rolled spinner bait. And I'm just moving it along very slow. I have a taut line so I can feel when one picks it up. And usually it's on the pause in this cooler water. You know, you pause it and let it sink and it'll it'll actually fall straight down in the water column. And then when it starts moving again, that's another strike trigger. Another strike trigger that you can do is you know, while you're going nice and slow with this, to give it a little bit of a hiccup, just go. And what that'll do is the bait will be, it'll be swimming along like this, and it'll it'll stop and it'll curl and turn around and face if the, if the fish is following. Now because it is moving so slow, they really get to inspect it up close, and that's why I'm using a scent. And I just feel like if they get that close, they can kind of smell it's 
smell the satin no yeah this is something i do want to eat oh that's a big one today i believe that's a nice fish at 19 just dropping it on the upstream side of the bridge pilings you know almost all the fish today have hit on the drop Teens and then I don't know that one's at least 19 in fairly shallow water just moving it real slow twenty and a quarter yeah there's the bait there's the fish nice way to end the day 20 and a quarter, just shy of four pounds. All the swim bait on the paws. Chris Funk here, I want to talk to you a minute about kayaks and weight limits. A lesson that I learned the hard way. The first kayak that I bought was rated at right, my, right at my weight. I jumped in it, water shot up through the scuppers, soaked me. It was January, I was in jeans. I liked to froze to death. By the time I got to the house, my entire nether regions was a lovely shade of blue. I never forgot that lesson. Paul Leibowitz has an excellent article explaining weight limits in Kayak Fish Magazine but I wanted to do a visual test. So today we've got a stock boat. There's nothing, the only thing I've removed out of it was the console. So there's nothing special about my boat. Uh, this is the Kusa HD from Jackson. It's rated for 425 pounds. I am 275 pounds. Don't laugh. Some of us have to go through life as a before picture. That is 300 pounds of sand. We're gonna try it at my, just stock weight, 275, nothing in it. And then we're going to put it at 425, the weighted, the, the rated weight limit, and then we're going to grossly overload it. You can see the buoy behind me in the water. My plan is just to paddle down one side, try to make a quick turn, and paddle right back up. There's a slight amount of current, so it's going to be with the current and then against the current. So we'll see what the difference is with this. I hope it shows something. Maybe this visual will help out.
Now you see why some manufacturers have a performance weight rating as well as a safety weight rating. Because once you start adding a ton of weight to a boat, the performance is going to degrade. A lot of great manufacturers are letting people know that now so that they can figure out, okay, I weigh this much, and this is how much gear I get. I might need to think about a bigger boat. Some manufacturers don't necessarily do that, and this is what you're left with. So we'll call that 275. I know this hasn't been purely scientific, but I wanted you to see what happened with a boat that was grossly overweighted. Hope it's been helpful to you, and y'all take care. Hey guys, I'm Robert Field and I'm in the middle of a West Coast tour where I'm covering over 4,000 miles starting in San Diego, going all the way up to Seattle, and then back home to Dallas. So I'm putting a ton of miles on my rig and I want to walk you guys through the Boondocks kayak fishing trailer that I use to transport my kayak. So one thing I really love about this trailer is that it's rock solid on the road. It comes with really beefy tires, I've already put 2,000 miles on them just in this trip and they hold up great. And because of the lock boxes, even if you don't have a single kayak on the trailer, it's going to ride really smooth behind you even on the highway. It's got space for three kayaks with these. You can get two up top and one down in the middle below. It's also pre-drilled to accept a four by eight piece of plywood or sheet metal if you want to store gear below instead. It's got a fixed tongue that's rock solid and it's got a wheel that pops down so you can store it wherever you need to and wheel it along if it is too heavy for you. So the kayak fishing trailer, or KFT, is built from solid aluminum. So you're never gonna have to worry about rust and this thing's gonna last you a long time. In my opinion, the best feature on the KFT are the two eight foot lock boxes that come stock with the trailer. It's got a two-tiered system for storage so you can put your rod and reels up top and then gear down below. So you can put your PFDs or any other gear that you have, especially if it's wet, and that'll keep it out of your car. Most importantly, it locks, so you don't have to worry about people stealing your gear. So another thing I love about the KFT is that it's easy to load. For the last three years, I've been car topping kayaks on top of my Jeep, and it is a pain after a long day of fishing. The KFT is low enough that you can easily put the bow up on there and then just slide it up from the back. It takes two seconds and it's not going to wear you out after a long day on the water. I'm Robert Field and that's how I roll. Thanks for watching. Tournament anglers tend to follow one of two major strategies. One, get a limit as quick as possible, then go for big fish. Or two, swing for the fence the entire time. I would like to offer a compromise between the two, downshifting to the most aggressive big fish pattern that works. You're gonna downshift the speed of the retrieve, the size of the lure, and the position you target in the river but make these transitions from power fishing to finesse as gradual as possible, stopping as soon as you figure out the most aggressive big fish bite. Here's how. We're actually in a tournament two weeks ago and uh, really power fished hard and that paid off. Early, early on in the day, really in the first hour, I had three of them 18 or better. Um, kept power fishing and, and really by power fishing I mean you're fishing fast you're fishing big stuff and in that case it was a fairly large square bill crankbait all right I haven't gotten any bites on this worn ounce twin spin yet so I'm gonna employ the first downshift and, and really power fishing is is three things it's size speed and really position and in the aggressive position that I'm at I'm at a major ledge system right right up here above um, and that's you know that's an aggressive position where they're gonna be feeding I'm not really downshifting in terms of size I still got a nice big almost seven inch bait but it's my speed that I'm gonna downshift with this big you know it's a Lucky Craft Pointer 128. Nice big profile. It has gotten cold here in the last couple nights and downshifting your presentation speed with a couple pauses is definitely a good way to, you know, 
still go for that big fish bite, but downshift, you know, incrementally from power fishing towards finesse. Shift number one was successful. Loosen in the drag. Feels like a better fish. Yeah, that was a nice one. Alright, fog's burning off. I've absolutely had to downshift to total dead stick with the uh, with the jerk bait to keep the bites coming. So two weeks ago, I could get real aggressive and and just throw a crank bait all day and just just cover water, just strain water constantly. And today, I got to go a lot slower. on the last treble hook. Very tentative. Not real aggressive. Nice fish though. Hey, right. I think I got a workable pattern. We'll go ahead and let this one go. inch Susquehanna Small Hey guys, Chris Funk here with the Feral Kitchen. Today we've got a two-part recipe for you. They're both relatively simple, but they're outstanding, so I wanted to bring both of them to you in one part. We're going to do some panko fried shrimp, which is one of my family's absolute favorites, and we're going to do cheese grits. And don't worry about, you know, writing down parts and, and stuff like that. I will put the recipe up, so you, all you got to do is pause and write down what you need to, or do a screenshot, whatever, it'll work out for you. So, y'all stay tuned. Let's get these uh, clothes off these shrimp and get the party started. All right, y'all, just got all the shrimp peeled. I'm going to go ahead and start the water and the salt for the grits. Always pre-salt your water because there's no way you can add enough salt to a grit after it's cooked. So just remember that tip. All right, y'all, while I'm waiting on my grit water to boil, I went ahead and got my dredging station took care of. All this is is a normal flour that I seasoned. I used a little bit of lemon pepper and a little bit of seafood seasoning in there. This is going to be the base. Now, I'm going to go from flour into an egg wash. And for those of you who don't know what egg wash is, it's just a couple of eggs, a little bit of water, and you just beat it to death. This is going to make the glue. This is just like making contact cement for that panko breadcrumb to stick to. So it's a very important process from the flour into the egg wash and then into the panko. It's going to get sticky and it's going to hold all that on there. That's what's going to make it awesome. Now you may see this bottle of hot sauce. That's going to be for an experiment later. If that works, I'll show it to you. All right, guys, my grit water's boiling. I'm going to go ahead and put... That's four cups of water boil. I'm going to put one cup of grits in there. Now we're using quick grits. Don't use instant. Life is too short to use instant grits. I'll go ahead and reduce that down and we'll cover it up. Alright, once it's backed off that hard boil, I'm going to put in my two tablespoons of butter. Alright, after they started getting good and thick, you, know, you want to stir them up every, every once in a while just to make sure they're not sticking to the bottom. I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of cheddar cheese. All right, we got our three-quarter cup of cheddar in there. We're going to add three to four ounces of cream cheese. It'll, it'll get nice and creamy in there. While those cheese grits are turning into pure awesome, we're going to go ahead and preheat this pan 
to get started with our panko shrimp. All right, our grease is up to temp now, so I'm just going to go ahead and start dropping our shrimp in. Like with any fried critter, remember not to crowd your pan. If you crowd it, it won't crisp up like you want. When you see the edges start to brown, I don't know how well you can see that, but I can see it that it's coming up the edge of the breadcrumbs. That's when it's time to flip. See how pretty that is? And as each batch gets done, I'm going to pull them out, put them on paper towels to drain. You can use a wire rack if you want to, but this will work well. All right, while my bride's back here flipping, we're going to do the other half of what I said. I've got a little red hot wing sauce. And uh, we're going to try to make a firecracker shrimp and we'll see how it works out. This is going to be taking place of the egg wash. So instead of the egg wash, going to use the hot sauce. Flour, hot sauce, panko. Alright y'all, the hot sauce on the shrimp, firecracker shrimp, whatever you want to call them, turned out outstanding. So that will be a must replicate at this house, I promise you. So we got shrimp two ways with the panko. This is the plain, this is the firecracker shrimp. You've got to try this. Got our awesome cheese grits. These cheese grits will make you want to fight somebody. They are so creamy, so cheesy. So, from the Pharaoh kitchen to your kitchen, get you some. Oh!